see a few people are joining us now. That's great. We'll just wait a few, maybe 10, 20 more seconds to allow people to jump in. Okay, we've got quite a few joining us online now, so we might make a start. So my name is Josie Garner, and I'm going to be delivering Dairy Australia's webinar on keeping cows cool, so all the ways that we can manage our cows this coming summer. So my name, uh, my role at Dairy Australia is Development and Regional Adaptation Lead. So my background is in dairy research. In a previous role, I was a dairy research scientist with Agriculture Victoria. Some of the research we're going to be hearing about today was the research I was heavily involved in in my previous role. I'm also joined by a colleague, Rory McDonnell, um, and he'll just introduce himself now. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm just uh, helping out Josie and a few of these projects, developing the extension content from uh, the Dairy Feed Best Program, uh, of which Cool Cows is a, is a key part of it. I have a background in nutrition and pastures and forages research and extension. Thanks, Rory. Okay, so for the webinar today, we're going to provide a high level overview on the ways in which cows interact with their environment. So the ways in which heat stress affects their physiology and their production capacity. We'll also talk about the practical management strategies that you can actually utilize during hot weather to improve your dairy cows responses in terms of their production, but also their ability to recover from heat events and reoccurring heat events. We'll discuss some of the short term and long term management strategies you can utilize on your property to set you up for future future proofing of um, hot summers going forward, but also the things that you can utilize this summer to set you up for success. Then in the second half of the presentation, and Rory will help with the delivery of this, is we'll go over a high-level overview of the nutrition research coming out of the dairy feed-based program, Feeding Cool Cows, where we looked at different dietary intervention strategies to mitigate heat stress in dairy cows. So just some housekeeping for this webinar. It is a one-way webinar, so you won't be able to turn your camera on or unmute yourself to ask questions. So please utilize the Q&A box in your Zoom screen and type your questions into there at any point during the webinar. And we will address those in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So at any time, please type your questions in there and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. Okay, so heat stress and dairy cow. So there's a few ways in which the overall heat load of a dairy cow can be um, can be developed. So cows, just like any other mammal, they produce heat internally. So they produce their own source of endogenous metabolic heat. So this is a combination of the way that their metabolism functions, but majority of this is actually contributed to the heat of production from the digestion and the rumination. So animal dairy cows are ruminants, so they've got their own source of heat that they produce in the rumen. So this actually contributes quite significantly to the heat that they have in their body. Another way that they gain heat is from the external environment. So we've got the addition of their metabolic heat processes, as well as the heat that they gain from this external environment. So when we subtract off that, the heat that they can lose to the external environment by utilizing their heat dissipation mechanisms, what the difference is, is their heat load. So when we see heat stress occurring is when we have temperature and humidity that increase, and then the cow's heat loss dissipation mechanisms can't keep up. So basically they're gaining heat at a rate that is faster than their ability to offload that heat. So that results in the observable symptoms of heat stress. So the way that cows need to maintain their core body temperature is quite specific. They have a very narrow range of the temperature that they need to maintain at their core body temperature at. It's between 38.6 and 39.3 degrees. So it's quite a narrow range at which they feel comfortable and it's the most productive space to operate within. So when we get conditions that mean the cow's gaining heat faster than they can offload the heat, that's when we start to see significant losses in production. 
So when we get heat stress, severe heat stress, or even moderate heat stress, we can get production loss of up to 40%. In some extremes, we can even get a complete cessation of lactation, especially when cows are later in their lactation if the heat stress is severe enough. So heat stress can also cause declines in total milk protein, but these are just the acute responses that we can actually measure during heat stress. There are also more chronic and long-term effects of heat stress. So these are reduction in fertility, but also these are contributed by an increase in embryonic death and conception rates can be reduced during heat stress as well. Another chronic long-term response to heat stress is loss in body condition but also their immune function can be susceptible, um, their increased susceptibility to infection. So their immune function is actually reduced. So what are the ways in which cows actually gain heat from the environment? Well, there's lots of ways and they're very similar to us in this respect. They gain a lot of their heat from direct radiation from the sun and the sky. So this is why providing shade is so efficient because we're taking out one of the major sources in which they gain heat. They can also gain heat, which is reflected radiation off any surface in their environment. This can be sheds, this can be trees, it can be the ground itself. So we know that the earth, the soil heats up when it's exposed to extreme solar radiation and that source of radiation can then be absorbed by the cow via conduction. So she will gain heat from any warm surface in her environment. So when it comes to a cow's heat dissipation or their heat loss mechanisms, well, there are a few tricks up their sleeve that they can actually utilise to help mitigate the increase in their body temperature. So cows are effective at offloading heat if there's circulating cool air around their body and they use this via the process of convection. Cows can also radiate heat to the skies. This particularly happens at night. When we get that drop in air, so air temperature, they can actually utilise that temperature gradient from the skin surface to the air and offload heat that they've gained during the day. This is a really effective strategy. It becomes less effective when we don't get that cooling temperature at night. Then we see they're bringing in that extra temperature that they've gained during the day and they're carrying it through to the next day. And this is where we can get accumulation of body heat from one day to the next. Cows also radiate heat to the ground. So when there's the earth temperature cools down at night, when they lay down, when they're resting, they can transfer some of that heat through their large surface area on their belly into the ground by the process of conduction. But by far the most effective way that they can utilise heat loss is by evaporative cooling. So evaporative cooling is by the process of sweating and then it evaporating into the environment. Cows can sweat. They're not as effective at sweating as, say, horses are, but they still do. But this process is only effective if there is a gradient in temperature and humidity from the immediate surface around the cow's skin to the air. They also utilise evaporative cooling via their respiratory system. They've got a very large lung capacity and they utilise that when they increase their respiration rate and panting score. So when evaporative cooling does not become effective is when we've got an increase in air, and in air temperature and humidity. So this image up the top here is giving a visual representation of how effective evaporative cooling can be when we have that temperature gradient. So it's lower humidity and lower temperature. The sweat's able to be evaporated and heat is transferred with it. This image down below is giving us an example that um, the evaporative cooling is less effective because there's an increase in humidity. So the reason cows are so susceptible to heat stress is the fact that we've got this very low thermoneutral zone. So thermoneutral zone is the zone in which cows feel most comfortable at their most productive, between five and 25 degrees Celsius. So this is an average. So some cows will have a different range to this, but this is just an average. So on average, most cows at about 25 degrees Celsius will begin to have the observable signs of heat stress. So depending on where the cows have been raised, like what part of the country they live in, their breed, their production level, all these different variables are gonna influence what that upper cr critical temperature is. But basically it means cows are much more susceptible than, um, than people generally would, um, would expect because this is quite a low threshold. 
at which we can start to see the observable signs of heat stress and production loss. Another way that we can visualize the susceptibility of dairy cows to heat stress is by standardizing the conditions into a temperature and humidity index. So a temperature humidity index is just a way to standardize different combinations of temperature and humidity and how that might contribute to the heat load of dairy cattle. So this matrix here is showing us a color coding of different combinations of temperature and humidity. So relative humidity is along the top of this graph and temperature is down the side on the left-hand side. Color coding from green all the way to black is basically a varying level of severity of heat stress. Green is no stress. Beige is mild stress. You won't be able to observe the physical symptoms of heat stress. When you start moving into the yellow zone, you'll start to observe increases in body temperature. The orange zone, moderate heat stress, is when you need to take action. This is when you need to be taking steps to actively cool your cows. Because if we get into the, the red and the black zone, there is the chance that cows can actually die from heat stress. It's rare. But if the conditions are right, if the conditions are extreme, extreme, it can happen. So this is a really great matrix to print out and stick in your dairy office as a way to visualise, okay, where am I at with today's weather conditions and what's the threshold at which I need to take action? So when it comes to actively monitoring your dairy cows for heat stress, there is two really simple and effective ways that we can get an understanding of how well are they tolerating their environmental conditions. So the first thing that you should look at is the breathing rate in cattle or their respiration rate. So a normal breathing rate for cattle is around 40 breaths per minute. Sorry, I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Is around 40 breaths per minute. Um, it's just going to, sorry, there's a thing on the screen I'm just moving, <laughs> is around 40 breaths per minute. So anything between 40 to 60 breaths per minute would be within the normal range. When we get to above 60 breaths per minute, the rate corresponds to a core body temperature that's about 39 degrees at this point. And this is the point in which you need to actively take steps to cool your cows and prevent the body temperature increase from, from, from increasing further. At 70 breaths plus, this is where cows are starting to physically struggle this is where they're utilizing extra energy to keep that core body temperature down. There's also another way we could visualize how cows are tolerating heat stress, and that's by panting score. Now, panting is something you've probably seen if you've been around cattle during hot conditions. So panting is just a way that cows are utilizing that respiratory system to help utilize evaporative cooling and cool their body down. It takes a lot of energy to pant. So this is when cows are actively struggling and trying to actively keep their core body temperature down. So there's a scale of one to four. So zero is normal breathing, no, so no panting present. One is where you can see an increase in respiratory rate. So you can see that they're obviously breathing harder. Two, the respiratory rate is increased. Panting is more obvious. There is a presence of drool. Panting score three, there's a lot of drool present. They're panting quite significantly and their mouth is open. When we get to severe panting, so panting score four, the mouth is open quite obviously. The tongue can stick out at this point. The drooling is excessive and they generally have an extended neck. So I've got a video on the next slide to demonstrate this, um, to demonstrate panting. So just keep those scores in mind and have a, have a go at what you think her score might be on the next slide. So I just want to highlight some data that we collected uh, in one of the experiments we undertook um, on the Allen Bank Research Farm. So this is just um, conducted during a summer. It was, I think, um, December of a few years ago. We had some cows just outdoors in part of a grazing trial, but we, we had some monitoring equipment on these cows. We we're measuring their eating behaviour as well as their core body temperature. And I just want to highlight the data on day nine of this graph. So the peak air temperature on this day is in the blue. Blue here is air temperature. It was 32.2 degrees. Orange is the temperature humidity index of this day, and it was the temperature humidity index of 80.6.
The red is the cow's internal body temperature. So her body temperature peaked that day at 41.2 degrees. And I'm going to show you how this cow was responding to a temperature of 32.2 degrees. Just as thinking back to the panting score scores on the previous slide, have a guess at what she thinks she might be. You see how rapidly she's breathing, a shallow panting, her tongue's hanging out, her neck is extended, and there's quite severe drooling going on. So she's at a panting score of four. So it often surprises people to see that a cow experiencing just a peak afternoon temperature of 32.2 degrees can be responding in this way. So this is a really good example of the level of physiological acclimation and how it plays a part in cows' responses to heat stress. So these are cows in West Gippsland. They weren't previously exposed to this type of temperature that season. So it was the first um, day over 30 degrees that season. And we'd had a series of mild summers leading up to this summer. So we can see that even at just a relatively mild condition of 32 degrees, we get cows that respond quite significantly. So this is a really good reminder that if your cows are at more than 60 breaths per minute, it's time to take action. We need to actively be taking steps to reduce that increase in body temperature that undoubtedly will occur when cows are experiencing those type of weather conditions. So to get an understanding of, to further decipher how susceptible your herd is to heat stress, we've got some information on this table here to help kind of categorize where you're at. So one of the biggest influences to how dairy cows respond to heat stress is their breed, so their actual genetic makeup. So we know that brown Swiss jerseys are less susceptible to heat stress than our bigger Holstein Frisians. But also what can be interesting is the actual age. So if you've got a herd that is mostly younger cows, so first and second calvers, they're actually much lower susceptible to heat stress than our more mature cows. So if more than, if less than 40% of your herd are younger animals, so in their first or second lactation, you've got majority mature cows on your, in your herd. Mature cows are more susceptible to heat stress because they generally eat more, they're generally bigger, and they generally produce more milk. But also about mature cows is they've generally deposited more internal fat around their organs. So that basically insulates them, makes it harder for them to maintain their body temperature. But also we've got to think about what is your average milk production. So the higher producing your herd is, the more susceptible they're going to be to heat stress. If you're producing more than 8,000 litres or 600 kilos milk solids per cow per year, you're in that higher susceptibility threshold. If you're less than 5,500, then you're in that lower end of the susceptibility range. But this isn't an exhaustive list of the ways that your cows can be categorised in terms of susceptibility. We've also got other factors that influence this, like temperament, their diet, which we're going to talk about a lot in the next, the second half of the presentation their previous exposure to hot weather. So remembering back to that physiological acclimation, how much previous exposure have they had to hot weather? Also their physical activity level. So how big is your farm? What's the walking distance? What's the topography of your farm? Do they have to walk up lots of hills? What's the actual conditions on your farm in terms of how much activity your cows are doing? But also genetics. So we know that genetics plays a role not only with the breed of cows, but also the level of heat tolerance within the breed of cows. So we know that we have a heat tolerance breeding value available to the industry that quite significantly shows that breeding can improve heat tolerance in your within breed. Okay, so now you've got an idea of how susceptible, excuse me, of how susceptible your herd might be to heat stress, what can we actually do to prepare for that? How do we be prepared? And what are the things that we can be doing now to set our herd up for the best success? So one of the easiest and most cost-effective strategies that we can um, set up in our system to manage cows is a sprinkler system at the dairy yard. 
if you want more information on the individual specifications of a sprinkler system, there's really good um, specs in the Cool Cows manual, which is on the Dairy Australia website. Another strategy is consider installing industrial fans in the dairy. This is going to be a particularly effective if your dairy has an orientation where you don't get a lot of airflow. Now, thinking back to one of the cow's most effective ways at offloading heat is by utilising evaporative cooling. That only really works if you've got airflow and constant airflow. So fans at the dairy is a really good way to help utilise that evaporative cooling mechanism when the cows are near them and keep airflow moving. It's also really good for your staff at keeping them comfortable. Water troughs. Now, this is something that we've seen come up quite a lot when we've been on farm delivering cool cow workshops, is quite often water infrastructure is a limitation. And it's one of those things that it's a system change. It often falls down to the bottom of the priority list because it can be quite extensive to resolve some of these water issues that have been going on on, on farms maybe for some time. But it's one of the fundamental things that we need to, to get right when it comes to managing cows through heat stress is making sure we've got troughs in all paddocks. We've got sufficient water pipe diameter. So thinking at least 75 millimetres in diameter to provide at least the constant pressure that we need to supply at least 20 litres per cow per hour during those hot days is the bare, is the minimum level we should be aiming for. But if you're only going to do one upgrade to your water infrastructure this year, it would be putting a water trough near the dairy exit laneway. This is really effective because cows will be thirsty after they've been milked. They're going to want to have a big drink before they have to walk back to the dairy. They can refuel, rehydrate before they walk back, and then they'll be hungry, ready to eat when they get back to the paddock. So dairies that have dairy um, troughs near their dairy exit laneway, cows will always stop for a drink. So that's a really effective one. Another one is considering a shade structure for your dairy yard. Obviously, this comes with a heftier price tag, but really effective, especially if you're in a climate where heat stress is a significant issue for you. Again, I mentioned the water infrastructure. Do a complete check of your farm's water infrastructure. Make sure you know what paddocks have issues with their troughs refilling or the ball floats constantly coming off or paddocks that you know need an upgrade in their water infrastructure. It's good to be aware of that before you get into the, the depths of summer and you're starting to have water issues. Another really effective strategy is doing a rating system of your paddocks from hottest to coolest. So based on the amount of shade cover you have, the water trough size and flow rate, and also the proximity to the dairy. So this is basically with the intention of identifying your coolest paddocks and make sure all your staff are aware of this is the protocol for our heat stress days. These are the paddocks our cows are going to go to because I've already checked off. I already know that this is the most suitable for paddock on the farm in terms of shade, water, and proximity to the dairy. So when it comes to actually managing our cows through a high heat stress day, I'm just going to run through a scenario of what it could look like. But basically what this all boils down to is trying to manipulate the time budget of a cow during a hot weather day that's going to alter and shift the times at which she's eating, ruminating, and doing physical activity. Because these three activities are going to increase body temperature. So we want to manipulate at what times of the day our cows are doing those activities to prevent further increases in core body temperature. So these list of eight strategies are going to be ways that we can manipulate the cow's time budget to help minimize that increase in core body temperature. So the first thing, and I know people aren't gonna really enjoy doing this, but milking the cows earlier in the morning. So even though you gotta set your alarm earlier, your cows will thank you for it. Because the reason being, if you milk your cows before and feed them before 9 a.m. on those very hot days, what's happening is you're feeding the cows earlier in the day before the peak temperature in the afternoon. So what happens is, you feed the cows early, as early as you can in the day, they're still going to be hungry because it hasn't got hot yet. Then they're going to have consumed the majority of their dry matter allocation for that for the day ration. Then they're going to be ruminating before it gets too hot. Then they'll seek refuge in the shade for the rest of the day before they're going to be milked later in the afternoon. 
So we're just manipulating that time in which her body temperature is naturally going to increase with that metabolic heat she's producing from digestion. So once you've done your coolest paddock braiding system in your preparation phase, you'll know what paddock they need to go back to. So have the coolest paddock ready. So have it ready the night before, maybe feed out the night before, so you can just make sure you get them back to the paddock as early as possible. Another thing we can do is manipulate the diet. So we're going to talk a lot about this in the next half of the presentation, but it, the basics are reducing that heat of fermentation of the rumen. So it boils down to basically increasing concentrates, feeding high quality forage. So high quality forage, meaning low fiber, adding a protein source and upping the amount of minerals, potassium, sodium, magnesium. So when we get to the afternoon, the peak temperature of the day, we do not want to be mustering cows in that peak temperature of the day because the first thing that's going to do is skyrocket body temperature. So we want to delay that as late as possible after 5 p.m. Before cows arrive at the yard, wet the concrete because that concrete has been baking in the sun all day and they're going to absorb radiant heat. Remember back to that image, they're going to absorb heat from the environment, from the radiant heat on the concrete. Wet it down before the cows arrive the water takes away that heat. Another thing you could do, and we've seen this a lot, is the size of the herd is actually outgrowing the size of your dairy yard. So if you have, you know, say you're milking 450 cows, but your yard was only designed to hold 300, then you've got a bit of an issue. If you cram that many cows into the yard, the first thing that's going to happen is their body temperature increases because they've just created their own microclimate. They're all huddled against each other. They're increasing humidity because what are they trying to do? They're panting, they're increasing their respiration. They've just created a microclimate of humidity. Really dangerous environment, especially in extreme conditions. So what you can do to mitigate that is muster and milk smaller groups of cows at a time. This minimizes waiting time on the concrete, but it also prevents bunching up in the yard. So that means you can more effectively use the sprinklers when the cows are in the dairy yard to cool them down. The next thing you want to do once you've milked the cows later in the afternoon is the cows are going to be hungry at this point because they're probably not eating much during the day. It's been too hot. They've just wanted to spend most of the day in the shade. When you get them back to the paddock at night, the first thing they're going to want to do is eat, is eat a lot. So make sure you're providing your highest quality feed at night because they will try and compensate for the feed intake that they've lost during the day when it cools off overnight. So you'll be able to get away with feeding them a bit less during the day if you make up for that at night. But your highest priority should always be to provide cows with adequate water and shade. And you know that your trigger point threshold is 60 breaths per minute. So you need to take action to actively cool your cows when you observe them at this point. But what about setting your farm up for success into the future? How do you future-proof your system that if you know this is going to be an issue for you going forward, what are some things you can do now to plan better for the future? So one of those is a significant tree planting program on the northern and western edges of pastures. Obviously, that's a more longer-term solution because it takes a while to achieve adequate shade from tree planting, but an effective strategy nonetheless fencing off trees to protect them and also to produce, reduce cows lying in mud, incorporating the heat tolerance breeding value into your um, breeding program is obviously a longer term solution because it will build generations on each other of improving heat tolerance. Installing shade at the dairy yard, shade is really effective and the economics of it show that it can also be profitable. Building a permanent shade structure with a solid roof over a feed pad. Now, if you're interested in going down that path, there is more information on the Dairy Australia website about building permanent shade structures. Um, and Dairy Australia is hosting a Raising the Roof conference. So if you're interested in anything to do with infrastructure, you can get on the DA website to look into that further. Installing shades, if it's not something you can, um, sorry, installing fans, if it's not something you can do this summer, then think about potentially how it might fit in for next summer as a longer term strategy. You can get quite um, complicated with sprinklers. There's lots of cool technology around now. You can actually set them with temperature controls and set them onto timers. So you don't even have to think about it. They'll just switch on when a certain temperature is reached 
and they'll be on a timer. So they'll sprinkle for a certain amount of time, and then they'll turn off, allow cows to evaporate, and then you can soak them again. So these are really effective, um, and it just takes some of the guesswork out of it. Okay, so we've spoken a bit about the ways in which cows gain and lose body heat, the ways that we can actually practically manage them on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, that fits within a farm system and thinking about longer term planning. But what about feeding? What about the research? What's it telling us about how we can feed cows during heat stress? So the second half of the presentation, we're going to talk about the Dairy Feed-Based Feeding Cool Cows project that I was um, involved in in my previous role at Agriculture Victoria. So, you know, the biggest challenge we have is trying to limit that rise in body temperature when a cow is exposed to heat. We want to limit that loss in production, which means we want to limit that loss in feed intake as much as possible. But we also want to make sure that any kind of feeding strategy that we're testing is cost effective. So we set out to achieve basically an understanding of how can we manipulate all the dietary components of a cow's ration test them under controlled conditions and how cows respond. So we utilised our controlled climate chambers, did very detailed controlled experiments and measured how the cows reacted to different types of feed combinations and manipulating certain parts of the diet. So the first experiment I'll talk about is this and then I'll hand it over to my colleague Rory um, to take over the second half of the presentation. So the, one of the um, things that we wanted to look into first was manipulating the forage component of the diet, because this is obviously the biggest contributor of the dairy cow's diet. So therefore, it has the biggest influence over the potential metabolic heat that a diet produces. So one of the things that we tested was chicory versus pasture silage. So the reason we chose these two is they're very commonly available summer forages in dairy farms in, in most of dairy, um, dairy states. So the reason we chose chicory is because it's got low fibre. It's lower in fibre than a lot of common forages, but it's lower in fibre than a, your typical ryegrass pasture silage. So fibre, this is a nutritional component that drives heat production in the rumen. So it takes longer to break down a kilo of fibre than any other nutrient. So we know that fermentation, it drives heat production, but it also is the driver of intake because it actually takes up physical space and drives gut fill. So we wanted to compare these two pasture types, a low NDF and a higher NDF or a medium mid-range NDF forage and see what happens during controlled um, heat stress conditions. So what we found was that the body temperature increase when cows were experiencing hot weather or hot conditions when fed chicory was lower than the cows that were fed pasture silage. So this fits with our hypothesis, lower fibre, the cows were able to produce less metabolic heat, able to maintain a lower cold body temperature. So even though a point, um, 0.3 degrees difference in body temperature doesn't seem very much, when you think about the range of their physiological temperature in which they operate, it's actually quite significant. We also observed that the cows fed chicory compared to pasture silage, they produce significantly more milk. So this is a no brainer really. So we encourage farmers to give this a try and ensure that even if you can't grow chicory on your farm, the basis is still, if you've got a higher quality digestible forage, use that in summer preferentially during those heat stress days. It's going to set your cows up to better manage their body temperature and potentially improve their milk yield responses during heat stress. Okay, I'll pass over now to my colleague Rory, who's going to um, take us through the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Rory. Thanks, Joel. So, yeah, I'll try and uh, keep up with the, you know, the standard you set so far. So, um, yeah, the next probably thing that, that the guys at Ellen Bank looked at um, to try and uh, see if it had an impact on, on, on nutritional management of heat stress was betaine. So betaine is an additive. Uh, it's an extract from sugar beet. So it's a small, it's just an additive that you generally would see uh, added into grain mixes or, or concentrate mixes. 
on a lot of farms uh, over the hotter periods of the year. And it, it assists in some of the mechanisms that it uh, uh, uses to help with heat stress um, from a nutritional perspective is that it, it assists in maintaining cellular fluid balance and reduces, therefore, the base heat, uh, the base heat load or heat production and maintenance requirements uh, for cows. So there's some evidence, there was some evidence from pre-dairy uh, feed base that was published in 2019 uh, from the team at uh, Melbourne University that was done at Dupuy in Northern Victoria. Um, and that was an outdoor summer experiment. Uh, it wasn't under controlled climatic chamber conditions like, like the team at Bank did. Uh, and they showed that feeding betaine in February and March in the hotter months of the year, obviously, uh, lifted milk yield by approximately 6% compared to cows that weren't fed beet, which is a substantial amount and certainly something worth uh, worth chasing. Um, the other good thing about betaine is that it's relatively cheap to use, um, unlike some of the other supplements that, that they looked at. So it wouldn't require a huge amount of extra milk or extra difference uh, to uh, very quickly justify its use. And so the aim of the <clears throat> experiment the, the team did was to see if beta and supplementation affected intake, uh, dry matter intake obviously being a key factor um, that we want to control and maintain as much as possible um, because it drives milk yield. Uh, and then we also want to look at body temperature to make sure there wasn't any um, inadvertent negative effects of uh, of uh, feeding betaine um, on body temperature uh, under a heat challenge. So um, we'll move to the next one there, Josie. Um, so yeah, the, these are the betaine experiment results. And this is the, um, uh, so the, the, these experiments were done in three stages. It was a preheat challenge where there was ambient conditions, uh, uh, meaning there was no heat stress involved for the cows. And that was just kind of a pre, Pre uh, um, experimental period. Then we had the heat challenge period where the, the THI was over 75 simulated in the heat chambers. Uh, and then uh, um, there was a post uh, heat challenge recovery period as well. So, what we're showing here is just the pre heat period and then the heat period. So, you can kind of significantly see the difference there on the first graph uh, the maximum body temperature, uh, the cows that were fed uh, betaine, which was the um, um, cows in the lighter kind of blue shade graph. Uh, we can see that there was um, a significant difference, um, substantial difference there between um, the, their peak temperature. So the cows that weren't had, didn't have BTM peaked quite uh, a little bit higher. Now, it doesn't look like much there. It's only a half a degree Celsius, but that's actually quite a lot in the context of a dairy cow whose normal body temperature might be around 39 or thereabouts, between 39 and 39 and a half, as you can see in the preheat pre period. So... Um, the thing, next question was, how did that translate in terms of dry matter intake and milk use? So um, in the preheat period, the dry matter intake was effectively the same, very marginally uh, hit, but there was no statistical difference there between those two. But uh, uh, as you would expect when the heat was turned up and the cows were put under heat stress uh, with a higher THI, uh, both groups um, dropped their um, dry matter intake substantially. And it's a good, in, a good illustration there, 20 kilos of dry matter intake down to around 16 um, um, that just is a typical um, response you see, and, and you would see that on farm as well when you see um, a heat stress event, uh, a fairly severe heat stress event occurring, which which is a uh, will have a big impact on milk yield and on the intake on, on the animal's uh, comfort and performance. So, in terms of milk yield, um, there was very marginal difference. Really, it wasn't statistically significant, significant at all. Um, the betaine did increase milk solids yield per cow by 9.4 kilos of milk solids. That's across a 212-day period. Now, Josie hasn't mentioned this, but when they did these research experiments, um, they also did an economic analysis, uh, an economic simulation to see exactly over the hotter summer period. So the 212 days simulates uh, the 1st of September to the 31st of March. Uh, and it's done uh, on the basis of average temperatures in northern Victoria, that are predicted in 2025. Um, and this was published data. And in that period, you, you expect around 90 or 91 days to be on an average year to be over the THI of, um, of 75, which is when the cow was considered heat stress. So in that time period, when you when we applied these results to that uh, um, to full 212 day period, um, it showed that the betaine increased milk solids yield, and it's very much a prediction. You know, there's there's no exact science to simulate it using short term experiments to simulate long term results, uh, performance. But um, we would need around um four four point eight kilos of extra solids, which is not very much in a two hundred twelve day period per cow, to to justify the cost of the betaine. And when 
when the guys simulated it out, they actually found that they would produce around 9.4 kilos of solids, which is an extra roughly five um, milk solids, uh, five kilos of milk solids per cow. Uh, and that's worth approximately $30 per cow in that scenario using um, a, a six-year average milk price, probably slightly higher at the moment, given that the milk price is higher. So it is a smallish benefit, and there's a lot of assumptions associated with them. Um, any of these economic analysis where you're taking a short-term experiment and applying it over a long period of time but it's 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 an estimate it's better than nothing and it does indicate that there's very little risk attached to using betaine here uh, you can add it to the cow's diet in the summer months uh, in, in many ways quite similar to people using zinc and um, uh, to protect against facial eczema and things like that in, in places like big any skips and it's almost just we feel like it's almost like a routine thing that people could put in now and um, there isn't much uh, there's obviously no negatives from a, a temp maximum body temperature point of view and of course it's also supported by the previous research that was done in Dookie which suggests that there is actually under some circumstances a, a slight milk yield benefit there so um, yeah we'll move to the next one Josie um, the next thing there was a few different things that guys looked at a few different nutritional options uh, Grain mixes was another one that um, uh, they, look, they looked at. And obviously, there's a whole heap of different grains used in Australia, wheat, barley, uh, maize from the starch point of view. And then you have uh, you know some different protein mixes as well, uh, grain mixes as well. So the question was, was there different mixes and different options that could be, uh, that they all produce slightly different heat loads because of their different characteristics in the room. And, and, and then I suppose the logical thing is if, if there was a difference in, heat load production in the rumen from certain grains, well, then there might be some that are more suitable for use in the hot conditions in summer. Um, so the guys tried uh, and looked at a few different grain mixes, uh, were fed and tested again in these heat challenges. They did in early lactation cows and in late lactation cows to see if there was any differences to be found. And they also looked at adding some protein supplements into the mix, uh, canola meal, lupins, and cottonseed meal, which is also a pretty common protein supplement um, uh, um, in the northern states. The same type of economic analysis was done in all these experiments that I described earlier, that 212-day kind of typical northern Victorian summer. Um, given We just picked northern Victoria, given that it's a place where you know more prone to heat stress, obviously, than um, the southern Victorian states. And we can expect that the further north you go into New South Wales and Queensland, uh, there's a good chance that the um, it's almost certain that the actual amount of days over THI 75 is going to be even higher. Um, you know, instead of 91 days out of 212, it could well be well over 100 um, on an average year in those regions. So we'll go to the next slide, Josie. Um, we won't show all the experiments here because it was probably not a huge amount of differences between a lot of these grains. Um, but one that was of interest was in the late lactation experiment, uh, the protein grain options. And you can see they looked at four different mixes here. There was um, eight kilograms of barley and then there was some wheat and canola. Uh, used uh, at eight kilos as well, two kilos of wheat, of canola at meal and six kilos of wheat. Uh, lupins was an alternative protein source, quite common in Western Australia and some other regions. Um, and then we obviously had wheat and whole cottonseed meal as well, with, with basically two kilos of cottonseed meal uh, um, included along with wheat. So there were the four treatments. Um, and what we saw um, in this one was that the higher protein diets, so uh, numbers two and three there, uh, the, with canola meal and lupins, not so much the whole cottonseed, um, had increased intake and milk yields than feeding the straight roll barley. Um, so the other thing that was quite noticeable was adding the cottonseed meal clearly crashed milk yield, especially during the heat challenge period when, when the temperature was turned up in the chambers and the cows were um, put under heat stress. And that drove, what you're looking at here is an average across all three periods, the, the pre-challenge, the heat stress period and the recovery period. If we showed you just the heat challenge only, we would see that whole cottonseed meal even much lower intake. I think it was around 12 kilos of, of dry matter intake and, and, and subsequently, of course, that, that reduced milk yield quite substantially as well. Um, so we wouldn't, based on these results, uh, recommend the use of cottonseed meal to mitigate against heat stress in the um, hot conditions. Um, it just appears to, maybe it's a factor of the uh, um, high oil content in it, but it just appears to draw, uh, um, you know, depress dry matter intake and depress milk yield. Um, the other thing was, again, like many of the other experiments, um, adding the canola meal, and, and canola meal has been researched by the team at Ellen Bank for 10 years plus now, um, and there's still a lot of farmers obviously using it, but there's a, a good few farmers that still don't use, you know, a protein meal like this. It, it simulates intake uh, under ambient conditions, even got nothing to do with heat stress, and it also appears under the heat stress conditions to drive intake up a little bit higher and, um, and milk yield. 
uh, and we saw that and, and the same uh, result was found with the um uh, the wheat and the lupin mix as well so this is quite a consistent result with the canola meal in these research experiments when you see the same thing popping up over and over again with canola meal consistently driving intake uh, uh, and milk production slightly higher and um, we have good confidence in them we can recommend that um probably was you do have to be careful with the body temperature there was no evidence that body temperature was negatively affected really by addition of canola meal even though the more cut feed animals eat under heat stress the more heat they produce so logically you would expect potentially body temperature to go a little bit higher but uh, we haven't really seen that um whereas we did see it in potentially some of the other um added fat supplements that were used and there's more information on this type of stuff done in in some um uh, fact sheets that were um presented on the da website we're very much kind of skimming through the surface of uh, these experiments here um we'll go to the next slide there josie um, so just to summarize these concentrated experiments, we have good confidence in the value of the canola meal as a, as a good option uh, in a grain mix, both during ambient temperatures and during hot weather to drive intake and milk production. Um, and obviously one of the things we've tried to avoid uh, in heat stress is depressed intake. The other thing that was pretty clear was that the cottonseed meal isn't really a good option during the heat stress according to this data. So anyway, it, it reduced dry matter intake quite dramatically when the cows were put under heat stress. And that obviously is too big of a, a hurdle to overcome. Um, dry matter intake being down over a long period of time is, is a big neg negative um, uh, on farm and would lead to other problems as well, and, all, and then not least the reduced milk yield. So um, we'll move to the next one that we looked at then, Josie, um, which was fat supplements. Um, and um, what we uh, looked at here was there's a lot of protected fat supplements on the market, and a lot of people be aware of these um, and there's other fat sources as well that maybe aren't protected or are in our rumen in our fat supplements um, that can be on the market, can be potentially added to dairy cow diets as well. Uh, and the team looked at um, these dietary fat supplements are quite energy dense and they can increase you know total energy intake. That's the logic behind them. So um, you can support a higher, a more energy dense diet by adding a fat supplement, with really high concentrated form of energy. Um, but we also have to be careful. There's a few rules of thumb. Dietary fat levels shouldn't probably exceed five or six percent of the dry matter intake, um, and if, in particular if they're um, uh, unsaturated fat supplements. So in theory, the very concentrated amount of energy in a fat supplement could compensate for for this total energy intake being depressed in a heat stress event. Because always when cows get heat stress, there will be some form of, uh, in general, some form of dry matter intake decline. But if we can substitute in some more concentrated energy fat supplements, then potentially we might be able to mitigate that or compensate for that a bit. That was the logic behind using these fat supplements. The cow's total feed intake might be down, but the fat supplement is adding extra ME. So the overall ME intake might be not affected as much. Um, the key thing to remember here is that not every fat is the same, though. Um, some of these unsaturated fats, uh, fatty acids, like canola oil, and I'm not entirely sure how commonly it is used, but the team did look at this. Uh, in these experiments, they, they can add extra dietary energy, but the fat uh, is still digested in the rumen, um, which creates uh, potentially increases the heat load. Um, the, the logic around those saturated fats uh, that are commercially available is that it's post rumen digestion. So, um, um, you will move to the results and how, how we did this experiment. So, this supplementary fat experiment said, uh, just to be clear on this too, um, um, if this is the oil, this is the canola oil one first. So they used this one, and this is a good example of one that showed a clear benefit. We can see pre-challenge, heat challenge, and recovery there. There's an obvious increase in uh, milk solids per cow uh, in all three periods uh, when you use canola oil over the control. But um, but the intake, especially in the heat challenge there, which is in the bottom graph in the middle, you can see that the intake was quite significantly down under the control, under the heat challenge condition. And that's the key one, because that's the one where the cows are actually uh, stressed in this. Now, they did recover okay uh, once the heat challenge was, and these heat challenge last three or four days. Um, it depends. I actually think in this experiment, there was a number of cows that had body temperature so high in the, the big issue here was the body temperature was too high in the canola oil cows. It, it went much higher than uh, what was comfortable for the animals uh, compared to the control animals that didn't receive canola oil. And, and unfortunately, that's a negative that outweighs any positives of milk yield and milk production. And also the fact that there's a, a big decline in milk yield in, in, in intake there, um, these negatives kind of outweigh the positive of the extra milk from uh, this in hot conditions. So the, the research team was pretty clear that we don't recommend this strategy unless you are in a cooler region where there's only very marginal or milder 
kind of spikes in heat stress, which is you know really probably Tasmania and parts of South Gippsland and, and Western Victoria at, at best, and even they, those regions get hot in summer times. And you really want to be using a uh, good nutritionist advice before you would be adding um, something like this in, into the diet. Um, so that was interesting to see some of that results. Then we, we did another fats uh, experiment then um, where we looked at high and low NDF. So we combined that whole NDF thing that Josie talked about earlier and the, and the theory around higher and lower NDF forages. Obviously, the higher NDF forages being uh, potentially ones that increase the heat load because the technology digests in the rumen. And the lower NDF for higher quality forages, uh, in theory, should be um, a lower proportion of fiber, which means that and a higher proportion of the other nutrients, which means that there should potentially be less heat, heat being generated in the rumen. So this experiment was done during COVID, and so there was actually no um, uh, chambers or no controlled climate uh, system using this. This was simply a 40-day experiment in the middle of summer in, I think, 2020 to 2021, uh, when there was a lot of lockdowns and stuff going on. Um, uh, whereby uh, the team just fed a high NDF uh, hay and a low NDF hay, and then they fed it with burger fat, which is a pretty common uh, commercially available uh, protected fat supplement. Um, um, so the NDF hay was vetch hay, uh, and the high NDF and the low NDF um, hays were um, substantially different. And you can see the big difference here straight away when you feed the high NDF hay um, versus the low NDFA, it just drove intake up dramatically. There was no pasture fed to these cows. This is just voluntary intake of um, of what was um, high fiber hay and a low fiber hay. And then when the burger fat was added as well, we were able to compare, well, did the burger fat make any difference or not? And it was quite interesting. When we added the burger fat to the high NDF diet, which is the poor quality hay, uh, that's high in fiber, um, it did help. Like you can see that the uh, a significantly higher um, um, energy corrected milk and dry matter intake was was achieved in that second set of bars there where we added burger fat to that poor quality hay. But when we did it, when we added the burger fat to the lower NDF hay, which is the really high quality hay, uh, it really made no impact at all. In fact, if anything, it slightly um, turned back dry matter intake and what marginal decline in milk production, although it wasn't statistically significant. So the key point here is that um, the uh, added fat supplement didn't really work very well when you had a really high quality forage to begin with. But when we had a poor quality forage to begin with, the uh, first two uh, sets of bars in the graph, it did make a difference. It increased intake by approximately almost two kilos of dry matter and it also increased milk yield by roughly two kilograms of energy corrected milk. So um, something interesting there because a lot of people would look at burger fat and, and, and there's a lot of, you know, nutrition is going on. I think something from a farmer's perspective, you've got to work, you've got to really look at, if you look at, consider some of these fat supplements is how how much more milk you're getting back in terms of cost. They, they are expensive. They cost, you know, the best part of a dollar a cow per day, depending on the, the rate you use. Some people use 150 grams up to 300 grams. Uh, I can't remember exactly what was used here. I think it might've been closer to the, the uh, 300 gram mark of burger fat. Uh, so they because with these expensive um supplements you really have to be getting the extra milk back to justify their use uh, and, and in this example when poor quality high in the fh hay was used the burger fat was beneficial uh, in terms of milk yield and intake but when the porridge was quality was very good it didn't have any impact and you'd basically be just paying an extra dollar a day in your diet for cow without any real benefit in under this forage this forage type so um so we suggest that you know again you can only you can only base it based on the results that we used here with this particular forage type. There's obviously lots of different forages used on farms, but there is some evidence here that forage quality is the real thing that you've got to focus on uh, over summer, as opposed to you know the, these um, additives. They can be useful if you have a poor quality forage available, but but really driving you know uh, an aim to get higher quality forage and whether that's hay you're buying in or whether it's uh, silage you're making the, on the dairy platform in spring or whatever. Um, you know, driving high quality forage by you know doing best management practice around pasture management and, and silage making and all those kind of things, um, is the real solution maybe uh to having um less high fiber feeds to be fed in that hot summer period when the cows are under heat stress, um, so to summarize the nutritional research, uh, chicory compared to pasture silage, as Josie said, increased milk yield and lower body temperatures, the betaine. It's pretty cheap to use and it can lower body temperature. We didn't see any major impact in milk yield. It was very marginal, but over the course of 
the 212 days, if you simulated it out, it, it was worthwhile using uh, to the tune of around $30 per cow. Um, whole cotton seed reduce feed intake too much during heat stress, so we don't recommend using that. Uh, the canola meal increased milk yield and feed intake during uh, heat stress. And again, canola meal is something that's come up well in other experiments that have nothing to do with heat stress as well, uh, just production based ones. The canola oil did increase body temperature too much and reduced intake. So it's not recommended, even though it did have a positive impact on milk yield. Uh, and the protected fat supplements, uh, there was a bit of an interaction when the, when the, when the forage was high quality. Um, uh, low in the forage, it didn't really have any benefit, but it did when. Uh, there was high India forage yields. Um, so this is something we kind of use to summarize when we're doing this um, experiment, when this has been extended to farmers in the industry. Um, which triangle are you operating in? So there's two triangles here. We've got a stable and an unstable one. The stable one clearly being the one on the left where, where we have a, you know, a solid base. And then you put a, your relative emphasis on each of these three kind of areas that are on the right should be um, uh, based on what we see in the first triangle here. So the tinkering, which is breeding, you know, using the higher ABVs. Um, the feed supplements is very much a mid-ranking kind of thing, but, but <clears throat> there's no doubt about it, the system and the management of heat stress, so especially shade, infrastructure, changing all those milk plants, all that stuff Josie talked about at the start is really the foundation of dealing with heat stress on the farm, and the other stuff is more you get into that afterwards. Um, if you were doing it the wrong way around, you would be doing what we see here on the right. But too much emphasis on tinkering, stuff like breeding, uh, and a bit too much emphasis on maybe the feed supplement stuff, which can be useful, but it's still minor compared to the benefits you get from properly um, setting up your farm system around water, shade, uh, sprinklers, uh, and all of those things. So it's just something kind of good visual to bear in mind uh, if you're trying to kind of prioritize what area to, uh, uh, to look at on farm in terms of addressing heat stress. So, yeah, uh, I think that's the finish, Josie, is it? Yeah, thanks, Marie. Um, we'll take any questions now. We've got um, Brenda who's going to help read out any questions that have gone into the Q&A box. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Josie and Marie. Um, um, if anyone wants to pop in some more questions there in the Q&A, um, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, Marie and Josie will be love to answer them. Uh, you, look, our first question is to do with sprinklers. Uh, and the question is, uh, if we have sprinklers for the cows and the dairy before they come in for milking, is there any benefit in using the sprinklers during the morning milking or will this add to the humidity? Yeah, it's a good question. It's something that does come up about does wetting the concrete increase humidity? And a way to mitigate that is by doing it 30 to 60 minutes before the cows arrive on the dairy yard. So that means the majority of the evaporation of that water has already occurred and been dissipated to the environment. So you haven't got that localised increase in humidity over the concrete. So if you've got a really hot day and it's already hot in the morning, then by all means, use the sprinklers in the morning. It's still going to be effective. But if you're worried about that, you know, artificial increase in humidity from wetting the concrete before the cows arrive, just do it well in advance of the cows arriving. It's still going to be effective in taking away that heat, that radiant heat. The water is going to absorb that, but you've well allowed enough time for that humidity to be dissipated to the environment. So I hope that answers the question. Well, thanks for that one, Josie. Um, please continue to pop in some questions. Uh, that the only other thing I'd add to that one, Brenda, uh, is sure. that you can, um, it, it is a common thing popped up, and the thing Josie alluded to earlier around cramming cows into a yard, if you can really avoid that, um, maybe leave some cows standing on a really hot day if you have a small yard. Um, if you jam, sometimes you see farms that were built for 200 cows and they're suddenly built at 400 and they've jammed everything into the yard tight. Um, that's going to really drive humidity, obviously, when you squeeze everything in. Um, on a hot day even more so so trying to kind of do some of those management practices Josie suggested to try and avoid that um, it would definitely be another strategy you could add to as well right yeah okay the next question is probably more of a, a comment than a question but we'll see how we go with it um, this one is uh, in fairly high humidity regions uh, farmers are often restricted in being able to milk their cows later in the day and this is mainly because milk tankers have a set route. 
So they're coming in at certain times. Um, and so, and also because of the distance between farms. So the comment was, um, what sort of further measures can we take um, because of this situation? I'm not sure who wants to answer, Ruri or Josie. Uh, I'll have a crack at that. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one and it's it can probably be quite complicated and more regionally specific. So, for example, in Victoria, um, the farm, you know, I have a dairy farm and the farm we, the supplier that we supply, it's not an issue to ring up our field officer on the day and say, can you pick us up later because of X, Y and Z reasons. They'll just fit us into a different route. But, you know, if you're in a more um, isolated region or you haven't got, um, you've got issues around logistics, then it's probably going to be more challenging for your factory to pivot that quickly. But I think it probably just takes a really honest conversation with your field officer and be like, these are the reasons and this is backed by evidence that I want to milk my cows later in the day because I want to improve my animal welfare. I don't want to be mustering cows in the heat of the day and it's going to actually produce more milk. So they're probably screaming for milk up in those regions. So anything they can do to produce more milk is probably going to be in the milk factory's benefit. So it's probably just about setting those expectations and boundaries and having a really open conversation with your field officer to see what can be done to accommodate that request. Because I think it's so important that we can get that right and we shouldn't really be limited by the logistical constraints of our milk factory when the benefits to animal welfare production kind of can outweigh that. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, this one might be a question for Ruri. Uh, are there any differences in betaine being fed as opposed to natural or synthetic? Are they um, the same? So there is. Um, the betaine that was used in the experiment was natural betaine. Um, synthetic betaine, um, it's probably better if you can use the natural betaine. I mean, again, uh, we don't want to get into any kind of details around which companies offer which type of synthetic versus natural, naturally derived betaine. Um, what, what all we can say is that what was tested in this experiment was a naturally derived um betaine, which I believe is approved for use on organic farms as well, because that did come up one day by as a question by a farmer. Um, in terms of whether the synthetic the synthetic stuff is as effective, we I don't know to be honest. We didn't test it in it wasn't used in these experiments. I, I would imagine that it might not be Josie might know more about that, but um yeah, no, we didn't test the synthetic betaine, so probably can't comment. Um, I'd, have, I'd probably have to go back and reference the literature to see if there's any differentiation between synthetic and natural, um, but it's probably going to have the same mode of action in the, the body um, based on how it kind of acts as an electrolyte and, and changes the osmolarity of cells. So, yeah, I can't really answer that question definitively, sorry. Uh, no, thank you both on that one. Um, one question here uh, on the sprinklers. It is, um, are sprinklers more effective to be left on whilst cows are in the yard uh, waiting to be milked or turning sprinklers on and off over that, that duration? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can have a crack at it. Or do you want to go, yeah. Rory? You go, Josie. Um, so it really depends on... Um, a few factors. So some people have it automated in their system that the time that their sprinklers are on a timer. So they might sprinkle for five minutes and they might be off for 10 minutes. So the, the logic behind that is you're getting cows wet, but this is only effective when you've got really, really efficient sprinkler system and you've got adequate droplet size. So we want to make sure the cows are getting really wet and that water is being um, moving down the sides of the animal, covering the flank, covering the back, because the energy, the heat is going to be drawn out into the water. But also when the water is dropping down to the ground, that's that's taking heat with it. But also what's more effective is actually allowing that to evaporate slightly. So by doing on-off, on-off, that can increase the ability for that evaporative cooling to happen. But then, you know, some people might argue that it's increasing the humidity of that environment, <clears throat> sorry, of that environment. So it's like a double-edged sword and it's just depending on how, you know, what how extreme the conditions are, how quickly that level of evaporation is occurring. I would probably only recommend that strategy in a dry heat. If you're in a dry heat and the, that excess water on those cows' backs is going to evaporate very quickly, then yes, that strategy would be very effective. If you've got a really high humidity environment, you're probably best to keep those sprinklers on because the most effective way your cows are going to be able to utilise the 
the water to offload heat is by getting saturated and that water flowing off their body. Ah, there's, um, thanks, JC. Thanks, Rui. There isn't any more questions coming through unless anyone else wants to quickly pop one in. If not, I think we're probably close to getting out of time. I'll hand back to you, JC. All right, thanks, Brenda. Um, yeah, so we're probably running out of time to take any more questions. But um, anyone that did register for this webinar, I will be sending out the recording of this webinar to all the email addresses that registered, as well as um, the links to the um, further detail on the research, the fact sheets that we've developed so far on the research from the Feeding Cool Cows program, as well as the link to the updated Feeding uh, Cool Cows manual that's just recently been updated. So thanks everyone for joining us for this webinar and um, please reach out if you have any questions or you'd like support with managing cows through this hot summer. Thanks for joining us. Thanks everyone.